Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this live event brought to you by Futurium and the Schwarzkopf Foundation. Futurium is a joint venture between the German government and many institutions using science as a base for looking at questions regarding the future. And the Schwarzkopf Foundation Young Europe is an organization striving to empower young people from all backgrounds to become active European citizens. My name is Anna Saraste, and it's my pleasure to moderate this discussion on marginalized voices in Europe. But this time we want to look at what Europe and Europeans can do better. So we are here not just to highlight challenges, but hopefully also some solutions and a path forward based on young, fresh ideas. For that, we're joined tonight by four outstanding individuals who will share their insights and experiences around the topic. Together, we will address the deficits in participation, but also opportunities, and talk about strategies on how young people and marginalized voices can better reach decision makers, build inclusive spaces, and shape the civic debate. Our speakers will share us, with us their ideas on concrete steps for a strong European society where everyone feels included. Tonight's event is part of Machba, the series on shaping the future that shows how and where futures are made and how everyone can shape the future together. Before we dive in, uh, please let me stress that we're also looking forward to many, many questions from our audience. You can post your questions uh, to our speakers um, under the Facebook and YouTube live streams of the event. And I will try to my uh, best abilities to include them into the discussion. And please also make sure if you have a question directed at one speaker specifically, then we will also know uh, whom it's meant for. Um, but now let's move to the main actors of tonight, um, who are obviously our four speakers. Uh, in order to introduce them, we have prepared a short video um, where we can see who is here, us, here with us today. Let's have a look. Hello everybody, I'm Yasmina Wiran and I'm an advocate for gender and social justice in Europe. Uh, my mantra is, if not now, then when? And it reminds us of uh, the fact that there is not such a thing as a perfect moment, but we just should, you know, dare and take that step. As an activist, um, I'm committed to uh, amplify the voice of immigrant descent in Europe. And this is why I'm the co-founder of We Belong, which is a platform and podcast that gives a voice to the new daughters of Europe, meaning immigrant daughters. Um, what I would like to change or to see uh, as a change in Europe is uh, the representation. I would like to see a more fair uh, and just representation of our society, in particularly of women and people of color. An appeal to all people in Europe is that we are stronger together and never forget these, especially in these times of uncertainty, crisis and Brexit. Hello everyone, I'm Maria Tenasova. I'm from Bulgaria and currently living in Budapest. I'm the young European of 2020 and I'm a Romani activist. As a Roma, I feel the Romani cause really close to me. I'm working with other Romani youths, I'm working for more political engagement. I believe that the Romani community has a lot of potential and especially the young people in the community. As Europeans, I really wish that we are more open-minded. I wish that we can connect more different people and different communities. Hello everyone, my name is Nozi Zwedube and I am a law student in Belgium. I am also a former president of the Flemish Youth Council and one of the two Young Europeans of the Year of 2017. What is my motto? I basically am always telling people and myself to believe in ourselves because I think that is very essential in order to get along in this life. As for my activism, I am very passionate about all human rights in general, but I do focus on topics such as decolonization, such as anti-racism and intersectionality. And a very proud moment of mine within this activism is when in our student-led organization called Undivided, when we finally be, uh, were able to put all of these topics on the agenda within our university. As for change in Europe, I really do hope that underrepresented, marginalized and excluded communities are finally 
being listened to um, or can finally be listened to one day in the future. And my appeal to Europeans or to Europe in general is to finally take the time to listen to these underrepresented and these excluded communities, because we also have to understand that the future of Europe is also very much dependent on how we treat these excluded communities. So I'm thinking of communities such as LGBTQ plus people, um, such as black people and so forth. When I arrived in Malta, I was 16 and a half going 17. I went through Uganda, South Sudan, North Sudan, the Sahara Desert, and finally Libya. My arrival in Malta was the end of an already very difficult chapter in my life. And as immediately after getting out of detention, I started working. I've worked in construction, I've worked in washing dishes at different restaurants and that is how I got myself to the point where I am today and from then on I had to find my way because I did not want to be labelled a burden. Malta is not my end destination, I want to move on. I have passed from my native Somalia to Kenya where I grew up to Malta that helped me to find myself. Indeed, as my mother likes to say, Variety is the spice of life. All right, everyone. So uh, let's welcome Farah Abdi, Maria Atanasova, Nosiswe Dube, and Yasmin Wirhana. Uh, we're very pleased to have you here with us tonight. Um, Farah, let's start with you. In the video, we could see you in Malta, but this is uh, not where you are uh, anymore. So could you please uh, tell us uh, briefly where you are and also complete uh, the following sentence as a start for our discussion. My relationship to Europe is. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, at the moment, uh, thank you very much. At the moment, I'm living in Berlin, Germany since the end of 2016 but I still go to Malta uh, at least once, two or three times a year. Unfortunately, not anymore because of the pandemic. Uh, and Europe for me is a beacon of hope and human rights and democracy. Thank you. Yasmin, let's move on to you. Uh, how would you complete the following sentence? What I value most about Europe is... Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, this important conversation. I will start saying what I value about Europe um, is the, um, in, the, the, the project of peace that it represents and the possibility to instill dialogue and intercultural exchange. And I think especially in these times uh, where borders are closed and where our movement is limited, we are reminded of the um, importance of a union uh, and the importance of solidarity, just to echo what has been said already. Excellent. I'm sure we will get to that in a moment again. Um, but to uh, still go for the introductions, Nosiswe, well, let's move on to you. Uh, you also get to complete a sentence, perhaps this time on a more critical note. Uh, in the Europe of today, it is still taboo to um, okay, so yes, uh, I am Nazizu Dube and I also just want to thank you um, for, for the invitation, of course, and for the opportunity to have such an important discussion. Um, but as for me in the Europe of today, it is still taboo um, to critically introspect Europe's past, um, particularly with other communities that are obviously not from Europe themselves. Uh, themselves and I think that is something hopefully that we can also get into later on but uh, it definitely is a working point uh, with regards to Europe. We will definitely get into that uh, in a moment and Maria welcome uh, to the discussion as well. Uh, your kickoff today would be to finalize the following statement what Europeans struggle most with is
Maria, I think uh, you have to unmute yourself. At least uh, I'm not able to hear you. Let's try again. Okay, don't worry about it. Uh, we will look at it in a moment and you will get to um, conclude your sentence. Uh, meanwhile, let's actually introduce another person who is also on this call, who is Imke Schmidt-Sari. You can see now just her hand at a part of uh, her, her recording. Hello there, Imke. It's great to see you. Um, so she's actually here to do a graphic recording of our discussion tonight. Um, perhaps, Imke, you could uh, just take a brief moment to explain what a graphic recording is and what we will later see in your drawing. Well, um, the most important thing is listening. And I think this is uh, the whole event tonight is about listening to, to perspectives we normally don't listen to. And so this is the biggest part of my job to listen and put it into, into pictures and in words and create a, a yeah, a piece of art of it and the documentation of this event. This is what I'm trying to do tonight. Excellent. I'm sure we will be able to follow your progress as we move through the event and uh, also check back to you to see how it's going. Uh, thanks so much for joining as well. Uh, let's try once more, Maria. Uh, hopefully we can now hear you. So your statement uh, was what Europeans struggle most with, if you could give us um, uh, yeah, a completion of that uh, sentence, please. Ah, no, it seems we can't hear you. What about now? Can you hear me? Yes, wonderful. Okay, great. I'm so happy that... Okay. Um, I'm, I'm really happy actually to be here and I'm looking forward to our uh, discussion. So uh, what uh, Europeans struggle the most these days, I think it's uh, finding our um, common uh, future together as um, as as is our discussion united in diversity and uh, the motto of Europe. I think it's that we have to find um, through all the diverse communities um, something that we have in common. And, and this is Europe, I think, and uh, our future together. Absolutely. Thanks so much for bringing that to our attention. Um, all right. So we have there already quite many topics that you mentioned just in those brief sentences. And now let's uh, try and uh, delve right into it. Um, I would like to first us to focus a bit more on where marginalization actually stems from and how that also ties to the challenges Europe faces today. Um, Nozizwe, um, how do you see the link? You, you mentioned uh, Europe's past. So how do you see the link between Europe uh, European history and Europe's history and marginalization of today? Yes, thank you. Um, so yes, as I said in the introduction, I think that um, it is still relatively a taboo to really introspect Europe's past and to actually really analyze it so as to understand the specific challenges that we face today. So I'm thinking of challenges such as um, the asylum crisis, even though it is main, it may not be as prevalent as it was in 2015, 2016, and so forth, but it still remains a big um, point of debate. I think if we, if we look at you know how uh, black and brown people within Europe are being treated um, with regards to police brutality and so forth and structural racism, uh, if we look at environmental issues as well, I think a lot of these things, it is a lot of these issues, it is much more easier to understand them if we understand where most of these, uh, where the most of this oppression actually already starts from. And that also means looking at Euros, Europe's past for at least not all European countries did participate in colonialism, for example, which is one of the big origins of many of the problems that we have today. Um, but it is a definitely a marking event. Colonialism itself definitely marks Europe because we, we can see most of the wealth that we that we see around Europe today in most European countries does stem from the colonial projects and so forth. And then if you look at how people, uh, how black and brown people are being treated in different countries across Europe, you also then do see how all of that stems 
from many colonial thoughts and many colonial prejudices about black and brown people within Europe. And I think if we are not able to go back and look at that part uh, of European history very critically and be able to be taught about it properly in schools, be it in primary school, secondary school, college, universities, and so forth, if we are unable to do that, I don't think we'll be able to really move forward as one united Europe. And I think at this moment in time, especially with the recent events we had last summer with the Black Lives Matter marches, but also were very prevalent within Europe. It definitely showed that Europe has to do that. It is not just a United States of America problem. Um, and so therefore, it, the whole discussion about decolonization, it is still very much necessary to be held within Europe. Because even though there was a decolonization process the last century, um, mainly in African, Asian countries and so forth, the decolonization process in Europe itself did not happen. It still has not happened. And so therefore that's why we really need to still have that discussion about decolonization of our minds, the decolonization of our public spaces, looking at how we honor you know, colonialists in our public spaces and so forth. These are all big discussions we need to have to understand um, bigger issues such as you know, the asylum crisis, global inequality and so forth. And these discussions, do you think uh, they were also still started last year a bit with the Black Lives Matter protest or are we still at a point where we have to delve into that completely? I think the Black Lives Matter protest last summer offered an opportunity to start that discussion. But um, I did see, for example, in the European Parliament, it did spark a bit of discussion as well. Um, we had a, bit, a couple of um, a couple of you know, uh, meetings that were held and so forth. And I think there was a lot of de debates and discussions that were held, but it definitely did not even start to scratch the surface, in my opinion. Um, it, each, each and every single country has to introspect on its own past. I think the German empire had its own sp uh, specific, uh, sp specific things it did within African countries and so forth. Belgium had its own specific history within Belgium, Rwanda and Burundi. You can go on and on for many different countries in the European Union. Um, and so therefore each country really has to go on that journey by itself. But I do think that there was an opportunity that was lost with the momentum that was there with the Black Lives Matter movement. I think that politically, a lot of political parties really um, lost that momentum in order to actually really start to put more prevalent things and more prevalent issues on the agenda. All right, thank you. Um, Yasmin, I would also like to ask you, why do you think that Europe, as diverse as many people see it with its many languages and cultures, fails still to be a truly inclusive space for everyone? I think also to echo what Ms. Izzy was, was saying, um, there is a difference between discussing and bringing up a topic when it is, uh, you know, uh, mainstreamed all over the world and, and really uh, on the news, and then uh, working on it day by day. And I think it is important to have at all level of power um, and decision-making processes diversity. But when I talk about diversity, it's not just this token person that we put in order to show that we are inclusive, but truly having um, people that understand um, the needs um, of minorities and then having their uh, representation being a concrete response on policy. And I will make a concrete example. Um, in Italy, for example, we have um, many um, difficulties uh, in access to uh, certain types of jobs. When uh, the um, person uh, that is applying for this job is not Italian, uh, but in Italy, there is also a very long process in order to obtain the citizenship. And um, it is likely that people that are, are, have lived all their life in, in Italy, when they become 18, like years, uh, years old, they are asked to leave the country just because they can't ob obtain uh, the, the citizenship. They didn't apply, they didn't miss that deadline. It's very difficult as, a, as an administrative process. So just having somebody at the power spheres um, advocating for this and making people understand that there is um, uh, a need to be met um, uh, and voices these concerns is super important. So I would say, yeah, the priority is representation at all levels. All right, thank you. Um, 
actually, let's move on also to what was already mentioned, uh, which is the coronavirus pandemic, because in many ways it has also highlighted different issues around marginalization. Um, Maria, I wanted to ask you, um, just looking at uh, the pandemic that indeed started in 2019 in Asia and uh, basically brought mo most of uh, public life in Europe to a standstill last year, um, how that has impacted marginalized groups. And uh, maybe you can tell us a bit how you have witnessed um, the outbreak in your field of work. Uh, the, pand the pandemic actually has changed all of all our uh, lives in, in different aspects, but um, especially I, I, I can talk about the Romani community and, and the uh, Romani group. Um, we, al we always uh, see actually uh, Roma people as part of actually of Europe and they're always been, but uh, not uh, as recognized as, as officially. And uh, always there, there are some problems that we, that we know about them. And there are always like policies uh, trying to, uh, to make, uh, to, have, to, to find solutions. But during the pandemic, actually, we, we saw how, um, how the, the Romani community actually uh, went through it and what happened. And what happened to, to the community, for example, uh, in the beginning of the pandemic, I was in, in Bulgaria and um, the, the only thing that, that was the, the difference between all the other communities and the Romani community was that there were different rules uh, that are implied on the, on the Romani communities. For example, um, all the Romani settlements, they were closed, they were post, uh, there were uh, some checking points and uh, police in, in different Romani settlements. And that was uh, something that didn't happen in other communities, in other places, uh, for example. And even if there was a village or a settlement that uh, there were some cases, a few cases, so all the media attention was there and not uh, to, to the other communities or other places. Uh, so this kind of racialization that happened uh, because um, it's not supposed to happen as a medical worker also, I can say that uh, uh, medical diseases and, and infections and viruses, they, 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 they are not ethnical and, and wherever uh, they are not, uh, it, it's not supposed to, to reveal the ethnicity of uh, the, the patients and the people who are suffering to the, to the viruses, but always when there was a, a case including a Romani community, uh, so the media was pointing out to, to them. And uh, that's uh, happened not only in Bulgaria, that happened in different countries in Europe in general. Uh, do, there, do other speakers have um, experiences from the pandemic and how that has impacted or even highlighted um, uh, how um, yeah, marginalization plays out in Europe today? You can raise your hand, I can. Yes, Farah. Um, thank you very much. I think in my experience, when it comes to the pandemic, of course, the pandemic has brought uh, daily life to a standstill across the world. And many, many people have died. But also the pandemic has shown us that how, when the pandemic started, uh, we thought that the pandemic was going to be the great equalizer because it didn't know if you're rich, if you're poor, if you're black, if you're white, if you're European, if you're not. Uh, that's what we thought at least. But then as the pandemic progressed, it was very evident that this was affecting marginalized communities, people of color. Uh, they were dying at a higher rate. Uh, and then um, it brought life to a standstill, especially for marginalized communities because for example, in the LGBTQI community, if you're transgender and you're transitioning, uh, your medication was put to a standstill because the, the medical community was not seeing that as an important situation at the time. So it showed us that whenever there's a crisis in the world, the people who suffer the most are marginalized communities. At least that's what the pandemic showed. I think I saw some other hands as well. Yes, Nozizwe and then Yasmin. Um, yes, I definitely do also um, follow the sentiments that um, Farah was just saying just now, um, that indeed we I read everywhere on social media and so forth in articles, opinion pieces, um, that many people did really think and believe that coronavirus would be the great equalizer, but um, it definitely was, is not the case. I think specifically speaking for the Belgian context, of course, because that is where I find myself, um, I do see that, for example, in Belgium, um, 
if you look at who makes up basically almost the entire um, workforce of like essential workers. So I'm thinking of people such as people who work in shops, people who are nurses, people who are carers, um, people who clean, you know, clean, who are cleaners, even at my university, for example, the people I see cleaning after I've finished writing my exam are all black and brown people. The people I see working in shops are all black and brown people. The people I see mostly as nurses and carers are black and brown people. A lot of them are women as well. And these people, these jobs are not always paid properly, but during the pandemic, they had to show up because everything else had, had been closed, which obviously meant sometimes as well that their health was being put more at risk, of course, because at the end of the day, everybody needs to use, you know, everybody needs to go to the groceries, everybody needs to still be taken care of by nurses and so forth. But we also don't see that being reflected in the money they get paid as salaries and so forth. So there you see as well, there's this very big discrepancy of who we see as essential workers and who we also pay the adequate wage for being an essential worker as well. And I think that's something that can maybe also be seen in many other European countries. But going on as a student, I de definitely did see as well that um, obviously with the pandemic, everything moved online. All your classes went moved on online as well. And then that's where you really see how online poverty, internet poverty and so forth, how that manifests itself. And it was really clear now with the coronavirus pandemic, because before it was just all speculations about what would happen if we were to have something like this happen and how poorer people and people who don't have access to internet or people who just don't know how to use internet and computers would really be impacted at another, in another, on another level. And that was definitely the case for poorer children, poorer students and so forth. And so therefore it was definitely not an equalizing um, and it still is not an equalizing pandemic in any sense or form. Mm. Yasmin, you're also an expert on education. Would you subscribe to what Nasi's way uh, was um, yeah, describing? Yeah, well, I, I don't know if I'm an expert on education, but what I can say is that um, I have seen, um, particularly in France, um, huge inequalities growing in terms of access to um, fair education opportunities, just because as this was saying, uh, and Farah too, it impacts, um, this COVID crisis impacts um, um, the population in a uh, disproportionate way, but particularly I've seen young people um, from immigrant backgrounds completely losing the touch with schools uh, or also missing their ear, they have to um, yeah, to, to, to redo um, their, their, the same year just because um, they lost motivation, they were lacking of the um, support at home uh, because maybe their parents were working and they uh, can't uh, um, give them the same uh, attention as a parent that would still work but from home, right? So... Uh, this, this is something also I've seen a lot of, um, yeah, discriminations in terms of uh, controls that uh, young people face in the streets or, um, and, and police violence that has occurred in France. Um, I, can, I can mention one in, in, the, in, in the city of Grenoble, it's a small city in France. There is uh, two young people, they weren't wearing a mask in front of their school and they got beaten. By the police so this was a case that is uh, on newspapers too and there is many of these stories that we keep hearing uh and mostly the people that are involved are people of color so it is very unfortunate unfortunate but it's something that still continues to happen and so when there is more surveillance and controls because of uh, this uh, crisis that we need to uh, deal with then the most impacted are also people of color yeah, something, uh, Maria, you were also describing before. Um, I would also like to ask you, Maria, um, since we also want to not just look at the challenges, but also maybe some solutions. So um, what do you think we would have to happen in terms of reforming the health sector that we would have more equal treatment and care for all? I mean, it's not just that um, there are more uh, people that, uh, that are infected uh, with uh, now, for instance, the coronavirus um, uh, within marginalized groups, but also their access to healthcare often isn't the same as for maybe mainstream uh, audiences. Thank you for that question. Before to answer to that question, I just want to uh, add to what previous was said, um, because uh, definitely we just uh, saw the problems now more visibly that already existed before the, the coronavirus. 
And uh, especially in the Romani communities and settlements, um, people are living in really poor conditions and they cannot uh, maintain the, the measures as uh, everyone, um, everyone else. And that's uh, sometimes from uh, governments and media was pointed out as their fault and, and not uh, actually as a problem that ha has to be uh, solved. And uh, something that um, I can say about um, the, the Romani youths and, and Romani uh, children, uh, because um, with all the online classes, so not everyone has um, access to internet and, and uh, devices. So that was a huge problem in Bulgaria, for example, and in other uh, countries where actually uh, kids were deprived from uh, the education uh, because of, of that reason. About the healthcare, um, about the healthcare situations, um, something that I think that should be a priority. Firstly, um, uh, bearing in mind uh, the conditions that are in um, many settlements are the the access, the access. Uh, even uh, if we talk about in a in a physical way, uh, because in some of the settlements, um, actually ambulances cannot enter even places uh, because they are not regulated because. Um, there are not uh, any um, any uh, previous measures uh, did so. Uh, this is one of the problems, um, and especially now during the the coronavirus, um, I think that uh, there is need of more cooperation between the mm -hmm. Romani communities and especially the health the healthcare workers, and um, and, and and the institutions because. Uh, no one from uh, from government institutions and healthcare institutions actually sees um, the Romani community as a priority priority or minorities in in general as a priority uh, when it comes to the healthcare uh, situation. Because uh, as I mentioned earlier, firstly um, there is a more rate of uh, of, of um, uh, sickness and and and. Um, people cannot maintain uh, the measure, so they have to be priority, but that's not uh, seen as, as it is. Um, something that I think that could be, uh, could be done, uh, despite the, the co cooperation, is if there are um, policies for uh, inclusively and, and in to, to include um, Romani people and um, other uh, communities uh, across, across Europe, minority communities. Thank you. Um, at this point, let's actually have a look at um, how the graphic recording is going. We see that there is a lot um, uh, of work being done by Imke. And if possible, I would like to um, just have a brief question for her and see how it's going. Can you perhaps uh, already describe some of your, um, of your drawings, Imke? Uh, describe what I'm doing well. At the moment, I'm jumping around quite a lot because there's so much, uh, it's so dense and there are so many Im important things uh, that I uh, have to <laughs> hurry up to, to, to grab uh, at least a bit of it because it's, it's, everything is so interesting and so important uh, to be documented. So, and so I am trying my best to, to keep on. <laughs> All right, we look forward to the finalized picture at the end of the event. Uh, so keep on going. Uh, it already looks great. Thanks a lot. Um, all right, we also have a question from Facebook. Um, it's not directed at one of the speakers specifically, um, but uh, 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 whoever wants can can uh, jump on this one. Um, the question is uh, written as follows: What chances do you see for Europe due to Corona? Anyone who would like to uh, answer that? Sorry. What Maybe. chances do you see for Europe due to Corona? Uh, I think this also means in terms of like what chances do you see for well. Um, more uh, inclusion, more e equality in Europe now that we're living in the midst of a pandemic. May I just um, yeah, say something? Um, I think that uh, we, we saw during the pandemic uh, so many mistakes that have been done and problems that already existed. So I think it's time uh, Europe to learn its lessons and to do something uh, and to do something about these problems, because I think this is a good a good time to 
to use it and to just uh, to just definitely um, make policies or or any any actions in in regard with these problems that have been exposed because of the pandemic. Thank you. Yes, no, this way. Yeah, um, I think I think I'm looking at it from like two points of view. So I definitely do follow um, what uh, Maria just said about looking definitely at healthcare sectors and um, making them robust enough for this until it ends and for avoiding something like this, obviously in the future. So obviously being ready for something like this, but obviously broader than that, it also is about not just about the healthcare sector, but it's also about tackling poverty so that you can actually ensure that people already have the basic necessities in normal times. Because if there's anything that I think that Corona really did show, it's that this poverty that we're seeing now was always there, but it was just hidden. What Corona did is just exacerbate it and make it go 100 kilometers per hour faster than we're very much used to. So therefore everybody couldn't ignore it, but it has always been there, this poverty. It's just been more exposed because there were lockdowns and there were quarantines and so forth. So I think that really goes to looking at like wages, as I said before, like essential workers, how much are we paying them? Are we really paying them their, their work's worth? Um, are we really taking care of children? Are we ensuring they have their basic needs, books, internet, all of those things for families? But I think if we're also looking at Europe, and this is the part where I was um, coming from in the beginning about introspecting about Europe's past and looking at Europe's place as just a continent in the entire world, because that is what it is at the end of the day. Um, we also have to look at how, if we're looking at the coronavirus and we're looking how vaccine distribution, for example, is being handled. We see that a lot of many rich countries, and it also has to be said, much, much of this wealth obviously also does stem from, you know, this colonial past and slaves, trades, and so forth. That also allows many European countries in the European Union, for example, to be able to purchase and hoard a lot of vaccines while leaving many poorer countries and many poorer continents without. And in the pandemic, this is obviously not really something that it can look like a very good thing because you're protecting ourselves here, but a pandemic doesn't work and doesn't stop at borders. It doesn't stop at continents. So even if all Europe has vaccines and everyone in here in Europe is vaccined up, with global inequality will still be, and other continents not having access to the same amount of vaccines as Europeans do, will still carry on with this, with this pandemic. And so therefore it also calls for the introspection of Europe and the European Union and looking at its position in the entire world and understanding that this is also an opportunity to actually look at that and look at itself critically and think about, okay, what is our position in this? Let's just not think about ourselves, but let's think about how we should also play a role in eradicating this, this, um, this virus, obviously, from the entire world, I think. Mm. And uh, as you were pointing out, and many commentators have also said, uh, for instance, trade uh, for a long time already is actually global. And in order to curb kind of have the trade uh, um, start again, uh, you also cannot, for instance, vaccinate only nationally, like all these uh, chains of, um, yeah, and so forth. Like uh, there, there, it's just one example of how we are actually living in a globalized world and we are really dependent on one another. Um, I would like to move on to um, something that has popped up uh, time and again now in the discussion already, which is education um, uh, from the perspective of, for instance, talking about history. Um, but I would also like to ask um, uh, maybe specifically uh, you, Yasmin, um, Again, um, when, when we talk about education and, uh, and how to sort of uh, also use that as a tool for um, inclusion, um, obviously many people point to affirmative action, but is that all we can do um, in the case of education? I think that precisely now that everything went virtual, it is important to make sure that we provide as many diverse um, tools as possible. And when I say tools, I mean, I mean also um, we have we had in the past uh, the Erasmus program is is still uh, there, but now we can't really. Um, travel even for short Erasmus Plus program, short term uh, travel studies, uh, trips, it's, uh, it's more difficult. And I think we need to rethink, you know, uh, to come back on in terms of opportunities for Europe to rethink the way that we use these tools. Uh, how can we continue to educate on intercultural exchange um, while 
being you know apart and being remote um how can we make sure that when we uh talk about education we don't only educate young people on schools which is important but we also educate employers and i can't stress this enough because um often young people are very prepared uh, they they have diplomas they have uh, the, 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 the theoretical preparation but when they come to the job there is still a bias and so uh, when a person has a certain name or uh, a certain um, um, ethnic background they have it more difficult to find a job so how do we educate the recruiters on diversity and inclusion uh, in a meaningful way because i can tell you for having seen colleagues working behind the scenes that ceos at the top of companies are still very afraid to bring uh representation they are afraid of the reaction of other people of their partners of you know trade in the trade uh, sector so i think it is important to be bold and to put these people in positions of power to say that it is possible and then um reflecting and re-educating employers on the way they recruit and you mentioned their intercultural exchange, um, especially now that it cannot really happen by traveling perhaps uh, somewhere else. Do you have some good examples of that, how it can still happen? Also a question to the others. I will let the others reply. I think intercultural exchange can still happen because even with the with with the shortcomings that uh, the virus has exposed with internet because uh, all the speakers spoke about that is that it has made us it, it it's very aware that we are a global a globally connected society and we can still uh, teach learn spread awareness because these days everybody has social media everybody has facebook everybody has instagram everybody has twitter so we can share our experiences and amplify our voices through those platforms and continue culturally exchanging because the only thing that stops uh, uh, all of this uh, hatred or all of this uh, racism and exclusion is by sharing our experiences and breaking down the barriers and at the end of the day proving through the pandemic and everything that we are all human beings who desire the same things, you know, happiness, health, education, uh, work, and just to live a happy life. Excellent point. Thanks, Farah. I would actually like to uh, continue with you because um, uh, when we prepared for this event, you also mentioned um, the importance of safe spaces when it comes to inclusion. Um, so I would like to actually uh, take a moment for all of us to talk about that. Um, how do you see um, uh, the, the impact that creating safe spaces, um, how, what kind of impact does it have on people who uh, face discrimination? Farah. Thank you very much. I think it's very impactful because uh, I will use my experience. When I first arrived in Berlin, I came specifically to Berlin because Berlin at the time was the only city in Europe that had an LGBTQI uh, refugee shelter. And by creating this safe space, it was telling my community, my LGBTQI plus community, uh, that also happens to be people of color and refugees, that there's this space for you to come, to be safe, to gather yourself again, to uh, protect yourself, to share your experiences, and we are here to help you and guide you through the process of discovering yourself. So it's very, very important to create such spaces in general for marginalized communities, because I think Europe has a responsibility to do that with all the colonial history, with all the injustice, with all the unfair trade policies. Uh, it owes the world as a beacon of hope and democracy uh, to do this, to invest in creating safe spaces for marginalized communities whereby they can be themselves, they can access education, they can access healthcare, they can access uh, critical services like therapy and, 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 and medical care. And this is very, very important, especially at this time when mental health is skyrocketing, especially again, when it comes to marginalized community uh, communities. And yeah, Europe has 
that responsibility because it cannot be selfish anymore, especially with the refugee crisis. It was all about, no, it's not Germany's responsibility. It's Italy's responsibility. No, it's not Italy's responsibility. It's Greece's responsibility. But the pandemic has shown us that we live in a global village and we cannot push our problems to other places and close our eyes and think that they do not exist anymore. Yeah, thanks for sharing also from your own experience. Um, I think I also saw some other hands. Yeah, may I just uh, uh, say something about the, the topic of uh, education and intercultural exchange? Um, yeah. I think uh, earlier it was uh, I mentioned how we are taught actually about our history and especially um, uh, the different uh, the different um, um, ethnic uh, um, the different minorities and different uh, races. Um, I think something that um, doesn't happen uh, now in in schools, universities that uh, we are uh, not taught about all the all the um, ethnic groups that we have in Europe properly. For it, for example, from my experience being in a from the educational. Uh, system. I never learned anything about um, uh, the Romani minority, uh, the, 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 the Romani minority's history um, in school or in university. Uh, the only place where I learn about um, our history is um, non-governmental organizations who are doing actual researches or uh, who are um, working with minorities. And I think that it's really important how we are taught in school and university because that gives the general, um, the general um, feeling and the general understanding, um, including including uh, all the the majority and the minorities. Because how we are taught that actually builds our uh, our opinions and our impressions about the other communities. So I think that it's something that has to happen, and it's really important. Thank you, Maria. I'm sure this also uh, applies to other uh, minority groups, but Nozizwe, please. Yeah, I just wanted to um, yeah, piggyback off what Farah and Maria definitely just said um, regarding the safe spaces and then also how it also uh, comes together to the education part as well. Um, because, um, yeah, for, so for I am, a, I am the coordinator of a student-led initiative at my university, the uh, Catholic University of Leuven, and the student-led initiative is called Undivided for K-11. And basically what we're trying to do here is to work on inclusion and diversity, but really work on it in a structural manner, because sometimes you do see inclusion and diversity is really much, it's become a buzzword, a hype word in a sense, where there's not really much meaning left behind it and there's not much structural change really happening behind it. What we really want to do with Undivided is really to start this discussion about decolonization um, within the academic spaces, because that's where, if we really want to understand about where the direction that we're going in, in as Europe, we have to really start by deconstructing this idea that was painted of Europe and a lot of European countries um, within our schools, within our books and so forth, which is a very Eurocentric view that we have been taught up until now, which also centers certain European people, as Maria was saying, we, we then don't learn about, for example, Roma communities and so forth, because those are not those communities are not centered because obviously there's an interest in centering certain communities above others. And so that's why we really want to start the discussion with, with our student-led community about um, decolonization. We're looking at it from very tangible examples. So for example, in my university, everybody has a course on philosophy. And I remember I had my course on philosophy in my first year as a law student, and it was this course called Global Fundamental Philosophy, essentially. And it was all 20 philosophers, all white philosophers, and these were taught to me as you know, essential philosophers and so forth. And you can think of philosophers such as Hegel, Kant, Locke, John Locke, you know, these very general people that everybody has learned about. Um, and then when I go on later on, and I'm thinking, but wait, this can't be global philosophy because I was born in Zimbabwe, for example. And I know other philosophers from Zimbabwe and they have also impacted the world, but I'm not being taught about them. And if I also go and look at like these other philosophers that we were being taught about, John Locke, Kant and so forth and Hegel, if I go and actually look at what they were writing about black and brown people, for example, or what they were writing about women, for example, it is just not, it is very despicable to say the very least, but we still don't look at that critically because we're just taught to say, these are great people, they brought this forth and so forth. And that's where, that's where the part for me comes in on the discussion on decolonization. We have to look at Europe 
also from the perspectives of marginalized people who were at the receiving end of all of those colonial rhetoric and so forth that has always been so inherent in our education system. And that is also, I definitely um, also is the case, for example, for other marginalized communities that are inherently European, but that, that have always been excluded. So it's not just only something about black and brown people, but it also is something about, you know, other communities in, in Europe, such as, Mar just as Maria was saying. And so that's where the, that whole discussion comes in. And then Undivided is also definitely a safe space as well, where we can start these discussions with the, among other students and, um, you know, start the discussion as well about LGBTQ plus students, about homophobia and so forth, the patriarchy, all of these very important discussions that um, are really essential for us to be able to move forward within Europe, I think. I think uh, your initiative at the university is also a great example that could be copied to other places, workplaces, study places, and so on. This kind of critical examination, it just needs to happen on, on all levels um, of education, but also of other public life. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Uh, we actually have quite a lot of questions uh, from the audience, so I would like to take um, one question from YouTube now. Um, I'm also looking a bit at the time. Um, as I was saying before, we do have a Q&A session um, that starts um, at around uh, 7 p.m., so in a couple of minutes. And um, just uh, stay tuned uh, in case you don't hear your question come up yet. We will surely get to it um, after uh, one once we enter the Q&A session. Um, but I will be uh, sure to, um, to mention that then specifically. But uh, here comes one question which is uh, directed at uh, uh, all, our, uh, all of our panelists. So um, in what does Europe excel in front of other countries or compared to other countries? And where is Europe behind and what should change? Who would like to answer that? Yes, Yasmin. If I can just start by saying, well, maybe it was not super good phrase, just because Europe, I, we can't compare it to a country in the sense that it's a, it's a continent. As many, um, there is as many countries as uh, different, uh, um, uh, different situations. I would say I can't compare Italy to, to, to Germany. Um, so, of course, I would say that in some European countries, I see many advances and I'm very happy about it and I would like these to be transferred in other countries and learn from each other before uh, actually yeah, comparing to, to others. But when we think about even the uh, management of the crisis, let's, let's just refer to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, we have shown that the European project is all about solidarity and especially now with the coordination of the vaccine, with the uh, um, uh, allocation of, um, um, medical services from one country to the other, uh, this solidarity that Europe has shown can be um, an example of, uh, you know, uh, replicable in other regions. Thank you, Yasmin. Other responses to, to this question? Otherwise, yes, Farah. Uh, I think I will speak about where Europe lags behind. Uh, I think Europe lags behind uh, in terms of uh, nationalism has taken off uh, and the pandemic has shown us again that we cannot uh, fight globally like issues, poverty, uh, the lack of education, the lack of water, the environmental damage. We cannot fight these issues alone because we are so much interconnected. So I hope that Europe is going to learn from this and take this as a lesson that nobody can be isolated. And the European project is very important, but it's just a speck amongst what is going on around the world. So it's also live what you preach? Exactly. All right, thank you. Uh, let's have another question uh, also from YouTube. Um, the question to the panel would be, what are communities that you see as underrepresented or not heard in policymaking today? And how would you like this to change? May I? Yes, Maria, please. Um, something, uh, something that actually that um, always triggers me is that uh, all across Europe, um, only in a few places, there are um, full representation of the uh, Romani community. Um, and I'm, I'm a Bulgarian and in, in, in the Bulgarian government, there is no 
uh, one political party uh, or movement who represent actually a Romani community. And I think that's something really common that we can see all across Europe uh, about representation in on minorities in general. Um, because as uh, Farah mentioned earlier, nationalism uh, has covered actually um, more countries than, than ever, I think now, uh, besides of course, uh, historical past. Um, and that's uh, something that really political parties and, and uh, representative, they, they are, not allowing themselves to uh, include in the agenda minorities and, and different minorities and, and, um, and migrants because that kind of um, affects their um, the opinion about them, which is uh, something uh, that has to be broken. And uh, they have to realize that um, policy making uh, and in, in Europe in general cannot be possible without uh, including all the communities. Yes, that's very true. Other points on this? Yasmin? Yeah, I think that when it comes to, because the question is which communities, I don't like the word communities, and I don't think that we need, you know, for every category of society, a person, at least, I mean, realistically, this would be very ideal and very good, but realistically, while in many countries there is not even one person that, that represents um, uh, in people with immigrant backgrounds, for instance, um, even just having uh, a few, might, they might be from any uh, socioeconomic even background. For me, being a minority is also not being part of the elite that in a society has in easy access to uh, decision making just because of their background. Um, for me, when a person has this intersectional understanding of what it means to coming um, or to having immigrant backgrounds or to facing inequalities, then they will be more able to um, effectively respond to the uh, needs that people like me uh, or, or like Maria or uh, like Farah face because uh, they will uh, know what it means to uh, be unheard or to not have your, uh, your needs uh, voiced or uh, addressed. Maybe you can briefly describe intersectionality. Of course, well, I would explain intersectionality as the uh, combination of elements that form um, discrimination. It could be uh, gender, it could be uh, ethnicity or race, it could be uh, class uh, and the combination of those uh, create what we can call um, an intersection of discriminations. But then how do we turn uh, these uh, stigma into strength? That's something that I uh, always try to ask myself throughout my work to understand that uh, what we see as an obstacle can actually become a strength and a wealth for us, uh, for the society we live in and um, more broadly uh, for, for you know, a better representation, uh, understanding that uh, precisely because we have faced unique challenges, then we can address them better. Thank you. We will continue the discussion very soon in the Q&A part of the event. Uh, but at this moment, um, we have to soon say goodbye to our graphic recorder, which is why I would like to still once go back to her. And uh, hello, Imke. And uh, here again to document this event uh, and I want to also already thank you for your great work. This looks like a fantastic picture. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm still uh, putting a bit of color in it. Well, it has been uh, extremely interesting and um, I just, uh, I'm just uh, um, have in mind the, the last part of the, of the discussion with the intersectional uh, understanding, uh, which is, I think, the, the greatest chance uh, for everyone uh, to, to learn and, and educate. And this is uh, what I doing right now. I educate myself while I try to document what uh, the talk was about. <laughs> So thank you everyone from my side. Thank you very much. Um, so at this point we say goodbye to Imke and we move on to the Q&A part of the event. Thanks everyone for joining.